Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining in. I'm Per Hegenes. I'm the CEO of IKEA Foundation. I have the pleasure of leading a great foundation that gets to work with a lot of great partners. And today we're going to start by giving you some great news about some of the great work that's being done together with our partners to try to decarbonize the road transport system in Poland. IKEA Foundation uses a lot of the resources to, to really focus strongly on helping create a livable planet for the many people. And uh, our partners work really hard to try to change global systems to protect the planet. Um, and by supporting them, we, of course, help them create pathways to reverse the damage and, and do that to what we call um, unprecedented collaboration. We operate in many geographies, but uh, one of them is Europe. And today we want to talk about Poland. And you should know that transport is the second biggest cause of air pollution in Poland, in Polish cities, at least. So I wanted to share with you a story. Um, when I went to Poland uh, in February this year, I uh, heard a story about a woman named Anna Dworakowska. Anna uh, was about to have a baby. And she was really concerned about the air quality and what it's going to do to her baby. Um, she knew that uh, actually breathing the air in a city like Krakow meant the same as equal to basically smoking seven cigarettes a day. And she was really concerned about that. So, uh, And she also knew that 45,000 people die of air pollution in Poland every year. And that's about 13 times as many people die from road accidents. So she was really concerned. So she had a choice and she made a choice to actually stay there, but do something about it. And she got together with five of her friends and started something called the Krakow Smog Alert. This resulted in an unprecedented collaboration between campaigners, businesses, uh, scientists, governments, to really get to a point where they were able to ban cold heaters. Banning cold heaters is a pretty big deal in Poland because they had 30,000 cold heaters and they were able to take that down to almost none today. So that's a huge development. And if you look at the air visual map, uh, I looked at it today, it's about 33, which means good air quality. So that's that's a fantastic achievement. But of course, Anna and her team are not happy with that. So they keep pushing and they keep pushing for how they can limit the number of most polluting cars in Poland, how they can uh, strengthen the public transport systems and create more clean transport zones. So I have no doubt that they will be successful in doing that as well when you think about the success they're created with the, with the boilers. So um, like Anna's initiative, all our partners on the panel today are great examples of collaboration in practice. You know, they've been moving agendas in Poland for quite some time on green recovery, on air quality and transportation. So the results are pretty promising and you will hear more about that today through um, this panel. So I'm very excited to introduce you to, to you these, these great partners that we have. And Sheila Watson, the Deputy Director FIA Foundation will be our moderator today. So welcome Sheila and over to you. Hi, Pear. Thank you so much for that very uh, personal reflection. I've met Anna. She's a formidable woman. Um, and uh, it's great to hear a little bit more about how things started for her. Uh, as Pear said, I'm Sheila Watson. I'm Deputy Director of the FIA Foundation. We're a UK-based philanthropy and we work around the world to support safe and sustainable mobility. And as again, Pear said, I will moderate for you uh, today. And this, I think, promises to be an extremely interesting session. Um, hosted by IKEA Foundation, for which I think huge thank you from all of us, uh, to showcase the work that they're supporting on sustainable mobility in Poland and to showcase the partners with who they're doing that work. So in this short period of time that we have today, our intention is to consider the particular factors and particular experiences of people working around the sustainable mobility issues in Poland. Uh, and Natalia uh, Wegrazin from yeah, the campaign manager for Poland at Purpose Climate Lab will tell us a little bit more about that momentarily. After that, we're going to consider some key themes which have emerged from the work 
in Poland to date, again, presented by leading partners. And then finally, we hope to have a short discussion of what we can all learn from these experiences um, and, and how they're applicable outside of uh, Poland itself. So first of all, I should, of course, say thank you to everyone who's watching this on Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube. Um, I'm afraid our format doesn't allow for you to ask questions directly, but do, please do engage uh, through likes, clapping hands, light bulbs, all those things uh, that show how pleased you are to hear what you're hearing from our panellists. Uh, and then finally, to my panellists, um, at least in the first two sessions, just a reminder, you have only 10 minutes for your presentation and to make your points and we will intervene to encourage you to conclude if you go over so please stick to your allotted time. So now um, over to Natalia who will uh, lay out as I said the background to the unique issues in Poland uh, in relation to sustainable mobility and perhaps also some of the common themes with other countries. So over to you Natalia. Thank you so much, uh, Sheila, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Natalia Wengsen, and I'm a campaign manager at Purpose Climate Lab. I'm based in Poland, but I work um, across the Central Eastern Europe region. And uh, just to give you a background, uh, purpose, uh, purpose, um, in Purpose, we build and support movements to advance the, the fight for an open, just, and habitable world. And this is exactly what we try to do uh, with, with our campaigns also here in Poland in the, in the area of transport. And yeah, just to uh, start with giving you some background about the situation in Poland and go quickly through some challenges, but also uh, opportunities that uh, we may see um, in next um, months and years uh, here in Poland. So as you, uh, as some of you maybe know, Poland is the European Union's largest coal-dominated economy. And um, the country is also home of uh, 36 out of 50 most polluted cities in Europe. And transport uh, plays important role for both, for reducing air pollution, which is the second main cause of air pollution in Poland, but also for reducing CO2 emissions. And um, even though air pollution awareness is pretty high in Poland, it's not necessarily the same about um, air pollution coming from transport. It's not, at least from uh, from research that we did, it's not that uh, that clear. But um, the carbonization of the entire Polish economy within the next 30 years to achieve um, a net zero by 2050 is an ambitious goal, but according to existing data and experts, it's possible. What we need is an action, and we need this action now. Um, and um, to reduce the carbon footprint, uh, of course, many things can be done. And uh, I'm sure that many of you know of this, but just to maybe put some examples uh, that are especially relevant for, um, for Poland, but also for um, other countries from the region, I think it's... Uh, one of the issue is uh, stopping or reducing vehicle usage, especially old diesel cars that are fueling Central and Eastern Europe, which is, uh, as I mentioned, relevant for Poland. But um, we also run campaigns in places like Bulgaria, and uh, it's um, it's a common issue in Bulgaria as well. So. Um, as um, to, to work with this issue, uh, I think we are in this good position to test some tactics uh, in, in different places and to make them locally relevant. I think that's, um, that's, that's, that's quite important part of, of our work. But of course, there are other things that could be done, like uh, developing low emission public transport, uh, popular, popularize, popularization of cycling, but also things like uh, increased investments in low carbon infrastructure. So by saying this, I mean, uh, of course, things like more cycle paths, development of urban transportation. Um, but also um, we saw in, uh, in recent months, many examples of this, exactly these things happening across Europe, changing the infrastructure to make it easier for people to uh, move around the city, especially in these difficult circumstances that we are all, all operate. Um, in Poland, we saw it uh, not on a massive scale, only in, in a few cities. So I think there's still much to be done. Um, 
we what we need is uh, is a commitment and action on a different level. I would say we need a commitment coming from uh, from the government and creating the whole framework and infrastructure for um, for us to operate it within it. We need um, actions coming from cities, uh, which are very close to its citizens and can really um, respond to the needs that people have. And now things like safety, uh, as, as I mentioned before, are really important. So it's, it's the role of the cities, but it's also the role of people to keep pushing for cities and places they want to live in, they want to operate within, and they will feel safe. And uh, it would be much easier for them to uh, yeah, spend time with family and friends over there. Um, so um, public mobilization, uh, I think, is this point that, um, that, we, that we focus uh, with, with our campaigns, but we also work with different audiences. We see movements coming from city levels and uh, the appetite for, for doing uh, more to, to make, make it more sustainable and to um, bring a real change on a city level. But there are a few challenges that we could quickly talk through. Uh, I just have four on my list, but uh, I'm sure that uh, there could be identified more, but I would focus on those four. One of them is political challenges and the uncertainty of the, of the reality we operate within. We had multiple elections in Poland in last years, and um, uh, it's, uh, apart from uh, focusing on um, election campaign, it's now time for actual action. Um, the other challenge I would say uh, I can I can identify in the field uh, of transportation is legal framework, and I'm sure my colleagues after will raise more issues. But just to mention uh, two is like um, problems with creating low emission zones. It's not that easy on a city level. Old uh, old diesel cars coming to to, to Poland, and um, taxation around it could be could be um, a response to that. Um, there's um, another challenge, which which is obviously economy based on coal, and no clear date for phasing uh, out coal. Um, so um, achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, could improve an energy independence, contributing to the development of new economic sectors, but it's still a challenge. And the fourth I would see here is uh, is the movement that uh, needs to be strengthened, and this is what we're trying to do with uh, with our partners at this call as well. Mm, so working with those um, that are crucial for for pushing for a, for a real change. And the role of this uh, uh, of this element is is crucial. And as some of you know, Poland, we uh, we can be very active and we can bring change. Uh, it's uh, in my opinion, it's a matter of um, of supporting uh, existing movements and those that are arising uh, in cities, not necessarily only in in Warsaw, but smaller um, cities and towns as well. And uh, to finish with some optimism, I would say that there are a few opportunities as well in, in, in next months. Things like green recovery investments and money available at the EU level. This is a um, big opportunity for Poland and places like Bulgaria also to really uh, invest them in the right way and, um, and move towards a net zero goal. Um, there is an opportunity for growth, creating new jobs, of course, cutting CO2 emissions. Um, but uh, obviously, there are lots of business opportunities uh, for different types of businesses from um, small on a local scale, but also um, building the biggest uh, battery uh, place in, in the entire EU, like it's happening um, in, in Poland right now. Uh, and to finish with the two I see uh, very strongly and want to finish with them is the role of Poland in the region. And from our experience working in different uh, countries across the region, Poland um, plays an important role. And uh, what's, what is happening here 
uh, is often um, uh, seen within the region uh, as a direction for the whole region, but also um, a strong movement here and uh, actions and being ambitious and brave enough to bring changes in the transportation area can inspire others. And we see tactics that uh, work quite well in Poland being multiplied in different places like in Romania or in Bulgaria. So um, by um, strengthening the movement and working very closely with different types of the audiences, uh, I think we can, we can achieve much more, not to only think about those progressive audiences, but also test narratives and build narratives that are um, acceptable by, uh, by a different type of the audiences. And um, I would like to keep you with this uh, with this thought at the end. And um, yeah, thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And over uh, over to you, Ashila. Thank you so much, Natalia, for that incredibly brief but very focused analysis of where Poland has been and you think is going. Thank you for ending on an optimistic note and also for highlighting so many of the elements that I think we are now going to be able to go on and talk about in a little more detail. So thank you very much indeed for your contribution. And now we will turn to our panel, uh, our first panel, uh, which, as I say, will pick up some of those themes that Natalia elaborated and will focus on the nature of the collaboration that is actually happening at the moment under the IKEA Foundation's funding framework, uh, which is designed to build, as it were, an ecosystem of expertise and commitment amongst fundees. So each of our speakers will describe a key area in which that has, has occurred. I will not introduce them, they will introduce themselves. Uh, and so first of all, we will hand over to Anthony, who will tell us a little bit about, I think, the vehicle market uh, in Poland and the issues that have been, that have come up and that have been begun to be addressed. So over to you, Anthony. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for watching us and thanks for your interest in actually Poland and our struggle in uh, fighting CO2 emissions and in our struggle for air pollution, to, to, to limit air pollution in Poland. Uh, my name is Antoni Bielewicz. I am a country program director at the European Climate Foundation. We are a uh, mid-size philanthropy that works with the largest uh, international foundations and try to um, engage them into work with the uh, with our local NGOs and country NGOs in, in countries like Poland but all over the Europe and I would like to tell you about a few challenges that we have uh, when it comes to car market and internal market on on on, on uh, vehicles in Poland so first of all, maybe let's start from, from a few numbers and a few, few important facts. Uh, so in the last 30 years, we are facing a, a large revolution uh, that is partially caused by, by cultural issues and partially caused by actually uh, free market reforms that, that has been introduced since 1989. So if you think of, of the growth in Poland, economic growth in Poland, we are also growing in a in um, terms of, 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 of car market and vehicles market. So in the last 30 years, the overall number of vehicles, private vehicles in Poland grew by five times. So 500% from like five and a half million of, of vehicles to almost 27, 28 million vehicles. So you can see how large is that number. But that's not also. All, but but that, that that's not only thing. Yes, we are the one of the largest EU member states with the with the highest number of private cars per capita. We are fourth on the list, and the second of the EU largest member state after Italy with like six hundred fifty uh, vehicles per one thousand uh, residents, which is actually enormous, and uh, it's also about that it's. Uh, uh, not only about quantity, the size of our market, but it's also about uh, quality. So changes that are following that uh, specific pattern. And if you think of a, of a market cars, uh, market 
the market in Poland, one of the major factors that influencing the whole um, internal organization of the market is that actually we are uh, heavy users of uh, second-hand cars. If you can imagine, uh, it's like that average age of a car in Poland is somewhere around 10 to 12 years. So it's quite outdated vehicles, I must say. And what's even worse is that actually there is a there is no sign of any, any changes in uh, in the buying patterns. So every year Poland imports like one million cars. Most of them are actually secondhand cars, usually quite old. So you can imagine that wave of of uh, used cars that travel from the from the west usually to the east of, of 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 Europe and ends up in Poland very often, and that creates a lot of problems. I mean, if you can think of the high number of cars and that growth, the dynamic growth uh, of, uh, of private vehicles, but also trucks, uh, if we think of GHG, CO2 emissions, it grew exponentially from like 22 million tons in 1990 to almost 60 million tons in 2019. So it means that it, it grew by three times, 300%, which is actually a huge challenge for the whole climate policy in Poland, as well as the climate policy in Europe. That number of old second-hand cars create, creates enormous challenge and enormous impact on, on air pollution. And uh, actually, just like Natalia said, um, our, uh, our cities are placed on 36 positions out of 50 positions of, of the most polluted cities in Europe, which meet, means that actually we are struggling with very poor air quality. That poor air quality is caused not only by transportation, but also by heating systems and uh, small heating appliances. But in large cities uh, like Warsaw, like Krakow, like Wrocław, like Gdańsk, even it's really, uh, it's really, uh, it's really. Um, a serious problem there. So we have, and of course, we are talking about traffic. If you have five times more cars on your streets, there is no way on earth to actually to actually uh, create enough space for, for, for traffic. But unfortunately, the exponential growth in the number of, of private cars came in, in link with gradual degradation of public transportation in Poland. So it's like that actually that traffic is growing even is getting even more serious than it would be if we could have a we could have a proper or well developed transportation, especially out, outside of the large cities like Warsaw and 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 and, 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 and Krakow and others. So that's the picture of, of the market. But also if you can think of that market you should probably focus on several issues that are directly related to that. First of all, if you have such a large number of heavy car users, let's call them that way, because according to some opinion polls, over 60% of car users use, use them, drive, drive them like every day, which means that basically they are using them on a on regular basis. If you have such large group of uh, of people interested in development of transportation in development of 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 of, uh, of uh, new transport policies it's very difficult to introduce radical radical policies there it's very difficult to actually make an average citizen of poland give up on his car and actually use public transportation even in the well the most even within the cities with the most uh, developed uh, transportation network. What does it also mean? It also means that, you know, it's very difficult to find a decision maker that would face that group of car drivers and people interested in, 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 in cars to actually uh, change, to try to influence their, their behaviors. But it's not that... Uh, uh, it's uh, impossible to address because in that case probably we wouldn't meet here and we wouldn't talk about about Poland as a as a field for for a reduction of, of, of CO2 emissions in air pollution. So what we are doing with our partners here in Poland we, is that we are first trying to address uh, 
and inspire our decision makers, both on the national and uh, regional levels, because the transport policies to some extent are, are dependent on the national regulations, but to some extent, uh, for instance, when it comes to investment in, in, in public transportation, transportation systems, it's fully dependent on um, regional governments and mayors and, and so on. So we are trying to uh, convince the decision makers that there is a strong need and strong rationale for uh, reduction, for changes in transport policies. And the best example is probably the electromobility law that has been introduced two years ago and that actually created a space for uh, investment, uh, mostly usually and mostly private investment into electric vehicles. And we are talking here about electric cars and and plug-in hybrids. So that's the uh, one of the one of the outcomes that we helped our grantees to achieve. But it's all not only about the national level, but it's also about addressing the uh, regional level. And here it's much easier to actually um, mobilize uh, local communities. And at the beginning of our panel, Per mentioned about Anna Dvorakowska and the Krakow Smog Alert. Actually, Krakow Smog Alert is a grassroots organization that for the last eight years campaigns and uh, discuss and pushes for really important changes within the, uh, within the city policies regarding both those small heating appliances and actually Krakow is the first city to introduce a total ban for usage of fossil fuels acting from September the last year and also on transportation and here uh, there are very interesting developments like actually I'm not sure if you know that that uh, actually Krakow is the uh, one of the largest has, has one, one of the largest if not the largest pedestrian zone in Europe it's also that Krakow is the most progressive on uh, when it comes to introduction of low emitting zone they already introduced that zone once then there was a pushback from uh, from um, citizens and then they, they are trying to reintroduce that uh, low emitting zone low emission zone with new measures and new important uh, policies adjusted, at, attached and linked to that. And I will leave you here with that reflection. So I'm looking forward to more, more interesting insights from all, all of our colleagues. Back to you, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony, for uh, that vivid picture of the vehicle market, of individual attitudes towards vehicles and of some of the early steps that are being taken to address some of um, those challenges. Um, you mentioned the importance of private investment in particular in relation to electrification. Uh, and I know that you work in, in partnership with a whole range of organizations, including uh, in the corporate sector. And so that links us rather neatly to our next contribution, which will uh, come from that sec sector. And again, I will ask Maria to introduce herself um, as she tells us a little, I think, about what um, we mean, uh, the, the, the work that she has uh, been doing in the in the country. So over to you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be with you today and to present um, what we're doing here. I thought it was a great introduction from Per when he introduced the, the mission of, of IKEA Foundation, who cannot uh, stand behind that vision, which is livable planet for the many people. The reality is that 9 out of 10 people are breathing contaminated air, according to a study that was released last, last week. So in terms of uh, scope, it couldn't be bigger. In terms of impact, it couldn't be better if we managed to, to revert this trend. The Women Business Coalition has been partnering with the IKEA for the past five years. And uh, the coalition has done great work in advancing science-based approaches to decarbonizing the corporate world with the Science-Based Target Initiative, and incredible work around increasing the commitment of corporates to buy renewable energies or electric vehicles with the R100 and EV100. I have just taken this role um, three months ago as a CEO of the Women Business Coalition. And um, we have done this at the same time we have developed our new strategy. And uh, in that strategy, we're going to continue to be very bold, but we're going to go deep and we're going to go deep 
in transport, which is going to be a very important part of, of our activities. We're also going to be go rounded, and I'll explain you what I mean by being rounded, and we're going to be holistic, because you cannot look at the decarbonization tra of transport without looking at the decarbonization of all the, of the other systems. It, it is going to go be about being bold and deep, but it's also going to be about acceleration. Acceleration, <laughs> which is not uh, acceleration of cars, but acceleration to net zero. Uh, because what we are seeing, and I'm going to go a little bit up to the high level, and I loved uh, listening to Anthony, and I need to then reformulate some of the recommendations I have given. But from a global perspective, we are now experiencing something that is called the race to zero. There's lots of companies that are presenting now during this week uh, their plans to be net zero by 2050. And um, in terms of the transport sector, all the OEMs have committed to electrify all or part of their fleets. 30 OEMs and component uh, companies have committed to the science-based targets initiative. Very recently, we have seen BMW, Volvo, Ford this week. But that unite forces with others like Peugeot, Volkswagen, Renault, Daimler, Toyota. The race to zero is going on in the sense that those companies are committing to be net zero by 2050, but some have said, actually, you know what, I'm going to do it before that, because this is a race, I want to be net zero by 2040, like Mercedes-Benz, as announced very recently. In addition to working on the ambition at Women Business, we, we work with the action. We, we, have, um, we have the theory of change is that if there is enough ambition that is mirrored by action by the corporate world, then the policymakers will have the confidence to, to, to put in place policies that are more uh, ambitious as well. And then we come into a virtuous circle. So in terms of action, I mentioned before, we have the EV100 initiative. This is companies that are committed to have 100% of the fleet electric by 2030. For the time being, we have 80 companies, including Lease Plan, Lyft, and many others. Uh, the journey, the objective that we have set uh, for our coalition uh, through this initiative is that by 2025, EV100 will have put in place 1 million cars, electric vehicles. We are around 80,000, including from the companies that are part of this. So it's quite ambitious. In terms of the policy, uh, we, we work with many of our partners. We have seven partners, business organizations, NGOs, CDP, DSR, WBCSD, the Climate Group, CLG, Series, and the B team. And uh, we work really well together. And the recent um, you know, small victory that we did is that we united 150 business voices uh, to say to the European Commission that we need to increase the ambition that we need to build back better, and we need to move the emission reductions to 55% by 2030. This inevitably will translate into ambitious objectives for other sectors of which transport is obviously a very important one. We don't work in isolation. We work with our partners, but also we work with other organizations, many of them in the core. And so when we have been working on this and the different tactics that we do to influence government to be more progressive, we work with, um, with Climate Works, with ICP, the European Climate Foundation. And it's quite interesting because we need to be credible business voice. But at the same time, you know, we're using the tactics and coordinating well with the civil society so that we say the right things at the right moment and, and have um, and, and, and we double down our efforts and successes. Now, when we look at uh, how to accelerate the decarbonization of transport, and as I said before, I would have spent hours listening to Anthony and the, and the reality that Poland faces, that other countries face as well. As well. And the difficulties of the conversation in the sector, uh, I'm going to give you, you know, from our experience, what, we th what, what do we think it works? So the first thing is that the objective might not be on how many electric vehicles we have, but how many passengers per kilometer we move with electric vehicles. So maybe the emphasis, and I hear that the public, public transport is not very popular, but maybe that should change, and uh, coupled with some mobility service companies that are uh, that have incentives and have bold commitments 
to also decarbonize their fleets. And for example, I was listening to a podcast by the CEO of Uber uh, yesterday that was discussing about how they're moving that uh, company and accelerating so that uh, in Europe, all the Uber um, um, trips are going to be electric by 2030. So let's think about, you know, how do we move the masses uh, and, and the more people and more kilometers with electric vehicles um, instead of thinking about the number of cars. Now, how do we move from uh, internal combustion engine to electric vehicles? Obviously, health is a very important uh, driver for change. And, um, and that should be close to the heart of the Polish people and, and the government. And especially after we have seen how the air pollution has decreased uh, in the in the COVID times. Uh, there are classical um, you know, policy incentives no, that will help uh, scale the use of electric vehicles from um, all that has to do with the taxation of uh, both the car um, and the parkings and the highways. We have seen great successes in, in Oslo. Building infrastructure, so we need to have fast charging infrastructure in the center of the cities because that's where the users of the taxis and the, and the, use, and the use, most of the use, users are going to want to have fast charging. Uh, there's interesting uh, discussion that Uber was saying, let's build the um, infrastructure in the neighborhoods, in the poor neighborhoods where the drivers live and not in the rich neighborhoods where they can afford to have a plug and where they can connect their cars. I think that's quite interesting. And I have also heard from, from car companies the concept of, um, of uh, using their dealerships in the center of town, transforming them. Because now people buy cars by internet as well and transforming that places where we can charge the cars. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to finish uh, now. I mean, there are two things that are also very important. It is not only about uh, moving to electric vehicles, that is quite obvious, but we need to make the grid, electricity grid green. And there is a lot of work to be done in Poland. And the, and the last thing is that we need to think that the, when companies commit to set uh, net zero targets, they need to reduce their scope three emissions. As part of the scope three emissions, the emissions from cars are very important. And, and there is a driver for change, but also the car industry needs to reduce uh, their scope three emissions by making those cars uh, more circular. I think there is a lot uh, to be done, but I come from Spain. And there I have seen how Madrid, who was kind of in the same situation as Poland, and I have studied that as part of my doctoral thesis, has embraced the change. And Madrid has introduced very ambitious uh, electric vehicle, public transport uh, plants, that they're bearing fruit. So I think I think I think there is a scope to to do much more, and there's a lot of scope for collaboration in this group. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you so much, Maria, for that. And I think nowhere, in a way, is it more important to consider those corporate perspectives. Poland has, as I understand it, 200,000 people working in aspects of, of vehicle manufacture, uh, including, I'm sure, in part buses, which, of course, can also be electrified. So that gets to your point, which I think is a, a good point, that we need to work out ways of moving the masses in a way which is clean, based on good, clean energy. Again, an important point. Uh, and I was particularly taken with your um, your commitment on electrification and a million vehicles. And I think that in part, of course, that reflects changes in the European regulatory system, which will really require a great deal more investment. And that whole regulatory system and legal system has been key, I think, within this partnership of work in Poland and leads me very nicely, for which I thank you, Maria, to our next speaker, um, which is Ag who is Agnieszka, Agnieszka from Client Earth. And I know for part of the work we do at Fear Foundation is to support improved data and analysis and evidence, and that's vital when one uses the regulatory and legal systems. And I know that you, Agnieszka, will tell us more about what you've been doing with Client Earth in Poland. So over to you. 
Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon everybody. My name is Agnieszka. Thank you, Sheila. I'm working, I'm a lawyer and I'm working with uh, ClientEarth. Uh, we believe in power of law and regulation and enforcement of law. And uh, we hope that working together with our partners, uh, local activists, local governments, as well as uh, national governments will actually bring uh, a change. Uh, I will share with you my uh, perspective as a, as a lawyer and as an activist. Uh, over the last five years, uh, I've been working uh, and I was involved in uh, fighting for uh, improvement of uh, air uh, around uh, Europe, uh, both, both in, in Bulgaria and in Poland. And um, as you know, Poland has the most uh, polluted uh, air uh, in Europe. Uh, over these years, I've learned that uh, there are three factors that uh, make uh, a difference. And uh, when these three factors work together, we can actually uh, ma uh, make a difference. Uh, one is uh, effective uh, legislation. That's from our perspective uh, is crucial. So uh, citizens and governments uh, know that there is a law obligation that provides a right for clean uh, and healthy air. And uh, we have this legislation in Europe. We have um, quite uh, effective uh, air quality law at the European level, uh, as well as, uh, in this case, in Poland, our uh, national framework and um, mm, levels of uh, pollution uh, are uh, described by law and the governments are obliged to comply with, with those limits. Uh, but that's the theory. Uh, and sometimes uh, the law, the proper law, proper national framework is not enough. Uh, the second factor which I uh, identify is uh, science and research. And in client earth, we very often refer to uh, proper data. And in case of air pollution, it's actually uh, very important because once we have a proper data about the impact of uh, air pollution on human health, uh, that uh, that speaks to uh, many uh, stakeholders, not only to the decision makers to enforce the law and to provide uh, a better and more efficient regulation or to implement uh, more efficient regulation, but also it speaks to, uh, to people. So on one hand, they realize that they have a right to clean and healthy air. On the other hand, they have a data, scientific data that, that shows the impact of uh, air pollution on their uh, health. So the third factor that I identify is a public support for the change and for the improvement of uh, legislation. Uh, I can share with you uh, two examples. Uh, one very successful that Antoni already mentioned, uh, and it's actually a perfect example to describe how those three factors uh, work together, how uh, public uh, support of uh, local grassroots organization uh, enforce uh, the change in Krakow, and also um, put pressure under the national government to amend a national legislation. Uh, it took eight years to make this change, to improve national uh, environmental law and uh, change uh, and amend uh, one of uh, the provisions that guarantee effective measures to improve air quality. But uh, as I said, that, that, that was a perfect example where legislation, lawyers, uh, science and public support worked together to implement coal ban uh, in Krakow. The second example is, um, it's, it, it won't be from Poland, uh, it will be from Germany when Kleinhof is working as well with grassroots uh, organizations. 
and uh, it's about uh, transport uh, transition and implementing low emission zones to restrict use of old diesel cars uh, in the cities. And uh, we hope this, this, this example uh, could be implemented in Poland because uh, what is missing right now uh, under the national uh, legal framework in Poland with regards to transition in transport is uh, effective measures to restrict use of uh, old dirty cars uh, in the cities and a push from the public to implement uh, those uh, measures. Um, uh, when we talk about transport uh, transition, uh, on one hand uh, is about improvement of legislation uh, to restrict uh, dirty cars, on the other hand is about uh, support public clean uh, transport. And um, I think that once all those factors will work in Poland, in Polish uh, cities, we can, uh, we can actually make uh, a difference. Mm. And that's uh, it from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agnesha, for that very clear description of the work that you've been doing. Um, the point you make about evidence, I think, is very, very important and the need to marry it with... Um, with with regulatory change and perhaps also legal change and i know that's something which has happened uh, in poland um quite recently and something which client earth focus on a great deal but you also i think were very clear to make the point that to go alongside all of this we need to change public opinion or we'll have support of public opinion and also civil society i think has to engage which is what this panel is really all about a great representation of that so that takes us to our fourth and final contribution uh, this afternoon, which comes um, from the Clean Air Fund, from Saskia from the Clean Air Fund. And Saskia will introduce herself properly in a moment. And as I say, Saskia, I think you're going to tell us a little bit about how work has proceeded under the auspices of the Clean Air Fund and IKEA Foundation to build public approval uh, for some change. So over to you, Saskia. Great. Thank you, Sheila. Um, so yes, my name is Saskia Heinen. I'm a portfolio manager at the Clean Air Fund. And the uh, Clean Air Fund is a, a philanthropic foundation that works on air quality, um, accelerating decarbonization and improving health. And we've been working in Poland for just over a year. And as we've heard, transport is a big contributor to air pollution in Poland. So we've joined a group of funders such as the IKEA Foundation, the European Climate Foundation and the FIA Foundation to work on complementary programs. Um, to provide an example, at the Clean Air Fund, we fund projects working on data, such as collecting information on real emissions from transport. Uh, we work on uh, adapting transport policy. We work on projects that are about campaigning and building awareness of both the issues of air pollution as well as the solutions. But underpinning a lot of that is building the air quality field. And Poland is a great example of how we can build the field in a country to accelerate action on air quality and climate, and in part through the collaboration of funders, as you can tell by the panelists that are present today. So to create action on air quality and climate, you need civil society. You need them to collaborate and build a movement calling for change, to build awareness uh, with the public on the issue and the potential solutions, so that when policy options are presented, people understand why and what actually that intervention will tackle. And also civil society need to have the capacity to consider policy options and respond in a way to ensure that the public are appropriately considered. So building the field is incredibly important because many aspects of transport need to be tackled to create action and cleaner air for all. And that requires many different types of partners. So for example, we supported a coalition of Polish actors which presented a package of amendments to Polish transport policy. Now the evidence and ideas from that now allow us to do political advocacy and build transport campaigns which promote low emission zone legislation and changes in excise tax to cut the inflow of old diesel vehicles. But to create a movement and to ask organizations to collaborate, we need to give them the space and the skills to be able to achieve that. And transport we know is, is a sensitive topic, so you need to bring people with you and make sure that equity and access and such types of issues are considered. 
So in Poland, uh, civil society is, is quite a young sector. And because of that, many NGOs rely quite heavily on a few key individuals and a lot of passion. So Pear introduced this session very well by talking about Anya, who started Krakow Smog Alert because she was concerned about air quality and wanted to do something about it. So it's people like this with passion and drive that have created local organizations and ones that have cr created amazing results. So for example, because of Smog Alert and other partners on the ground, for the first time ever, just a few months ago, for the first time ever in a national Polish election, the presidential candidates talked about air quality and what they would do about it. So that is a whole new topic for discussion. So, it, but it's not possible for, for organizations such as Smog Alert and other small organizations that are coming up to continue to respond to these kinds of opportunities without more critical skills and capacity. So both technical skills, financial, uh, human resources, but as well as organizational management capacity. If an organization has grown from the bottom up and hasn't had much financial stability, um, it's completely understandable that they might not have prioritized this, especially during times as trying as COVID or operating in an environment where the government doesn't necessarily um, support civil society. So we're currently supporting a number of smaller NGOs with interim funding to continue their work, but also core support to strengthen their organizational management capacity, working with them to do things like needs assessment, development plans, uh, provide coaching and training. And all of that will not just be beneficial for them, but also for us as the funders, for us as the movement. We're planning to operate in Poland for the long haul. So it's in our interest to build up the actors that are necessary to do the work on the ground. And as Natalia said, Poland has a role in the region. So actually building up civil society will allow lessons to be shared, not just in Poland, but also in neighboring countries. And that's how you really accelerate change. And with challenges such as improving air quality, reducing emissions, changing our transport habits, we really need all the, trans all the partners that we can get. So really just a, a huge thank you to the organizations on the ground and, uh, and, and the partners that we've been able to present alongside in this session. So thank you and back to you, Sheila. Thank you very much indeed, Saskia, um, for that uh, contribution. I know of the work Clean Air Fund is doing, trying to build from the ground in a very, a very stepwise fashion. And I think it's absolutely essential as funders that we don't forget the importance of helping organisations to build strongly, to embed skills, to develop in a way which was going to give them some longevity. These issues, I think someone mentioned an eight year time period for a piece of legislation. So these issues aren't necessarily moving as quickly as we would like, although we are all here to put added oomph under them. Um, I think at this point we're going to bring everyone from our little panel back together. I'm, I'm curious at this point just to, um, to take your views really on what you think the key challenge in these next six months is going to be. And I think also particularly, um, and I think I might ask you this first, Maria, I know you have to slip away shortly, um, particularly where you feel the collaboration of the fact that you are under almost a funding umbrella through IKEA uh, Foundation, how that's going to help you. So challenges and then how you think collaboration could support you in that. Maria, are you happy to go first with that one? Yeah. No, I'm I'm really fascinated by the collaboration and how much collaboration can, can help us achieve our objectives. Collaboration happens at different levels. I mean, starting uh, you know, with business itself, and that they need to collaborate across the value chain. I spoke about Uber that is talking and, and making deals with the car autom automakers, etc. I think at our level, collaboration so that we are all aligned on what we are demanding companies and citizens, and, and we do it in a coordinated way. And uh, to collaborate, you need to build trust. And this takes time. I have to say that for me, it's such a pleasure to come at this moment to to to, to the to, to, to run a Women Business Coalition, because that trust has been built, and not only within the group, but also with the implementation partners and many of the, of the community, the NGO community, through different partnerships. And I think we can go so far, really far. We have seen it with the letters that we have done, some activities we did in, in Germany as well to support this ambition at EU level. 
and, and we just need to aim high, collaborate, talk to each other, and understand that we are all bringing a different perspective uh, and a different angle to, to, to the resolution of the problem that we have at stake that is a, a common problem. So I, from a women business perspective, I need to credible, credibly speak about in the way that business will speak. But that doesn't mean that I cannot align with the civil society's movement or the policy work that other institutions are doing. We just need to use the right language in the right moment and with the right sequence. And so I'm thrilled. I think there's so much that we're going to do together. I think transport, you know, we're going to advance the end of the, the end of the internal combustion engine. And now it's around 2040, we will advance it to 2030. We'll still, we are going to see that the EVs are going to be competitive one year or two earlier. So estimate says 2024. I think maybe, you know, if we have the big players like Amazon or other players bringing scale and, uh, and demand, uh, we can do this earlier. And so this is a great moment to be in this place. I'm looking forward to the collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, for that. I think you're right to be positive. I think your point about language is absolutely key. key. We have to learn how to speak to each other in a way that we can understand. And then, as Saskia described, build on that to, to work with others so that we understand how they see things in the wider community. Um, but also, I'm curious just to come back really to that sort of question of the next six months, because in some ways this may be the making of us. It could also be a huge challenge for all of us. Somebody mentioned public transport. That's gone from fair to foul in a matter of moments. And we mustn't let that, that's one of my pet peeves. We must not let that happen. We must not let that go. But I'm curious as to what other people think are the challenge. And Natalia, maybe if I could come back to you, um, just for your thoughts on that, the next six months and how you think this collaboration will help. Yeah, I think that next few months are really important, especially if we think about the level of investments and all the, um, uh, the green agenda that could really happen. We are in this historic moment that we, uh, Poland can really have resources to, uh, to push towards a net zero goal with the support coming from the EU. I think uh, what is needed uh, is um, what I mentioned before, like mobilization coming from, from people on the ground, but also willingness from um, authorities on different level to really push for these changes and be brave. Um, and by having um, support from, from citizens, I guess it will lower this political risk for, for them. So I see it as a big challenge and, and also opportunity for really uh, changing how, how this will work. And we, of course, need to remember about safety and about where, where and when uh, are we talking about this. Because we already saw kids coming back to schools, we will see students in some places coming back to the universities, and um, public transport will play um, an important role within this. And we know that people really uh, are scared, and we we really need to tackle the uh, this this issue. I think it will be a, a big challenge also for cities how to. Uh, how to um, make sure that people feel safe and they are safe and encouraged to use the public transport as it was before uh, before the COVID crisis or even or even more. Thanks. Thanks, Natalia. Thank you so much for that. I think. Oh, good. We haven't lost you, Agneska. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that um, at this point we we do need to do the best we can to support political change. And you made a good point earlier about the way in which Poland has been rather going through it on that front. And, and Saskia, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'd, I'd be interested in your views and, and yours, Anthony, particularly in relation to vehicle ownership. But Saskia, how, can you say a little bit more about some of the, as it were, devices, some of the ways in that you've been trying to deploy evidence and, and so on to try and, and get that grassroots support going? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's about, uh, again, understanding what works for different audiences. So we, we already know a lot of the issues in terms of how air quality impacts health. That's even now um, more impacted because of the pandemic, because there are linkages between air quality and COVID-19. 
So this is also an opportunity to, to use this interest that people have in health, in their families, in their safety, and um, the evidence that exists out there to, to communicate with them in different ways. So it's about thinking about different types of audiences, whether you're talking to parents groups, whether you're talking to policymakers, whether you're talking to um, doctors and nurses who are struggling with many different things at this moment. So thinking about how to communicate to them and give them the tools and the confidence to be able to, to make changes in their own lives, but also advise others. So for example, we are exploring some different ways of engaging schools. So there's lots of different ways that you can use, for example, low cost monitors to um, see what's happening in the school, school playground or even mobile devices that you can carry in your backpack. So you have an understanding of the route that a child takes to school and the exposure that that child has to different types of air pollutants. That is really, really powerful to actually see your own impact um, your own exposure, but also how you can change your route, how you can change your transport, your, uh, your own behavior, and therefore change your vulnerability, change your exposure. So things like that, or even in hospitals where we're able to create these types of monitors so that people actually have access to this kind of data. They understand more the links between the decisions they make the policies that, that they vote for, the politicians they vote for and the choices they make and how that end result ends up in, uh, in, in terms of climate and uh, mobility choices and uh, air quality as well. So there's lots of different ways of engaging with different audiences and it's about kind of understanding where they come from and meeting them halfway because that's really the only way that we're going to create action. Francesco, I think that's right. And, and I think trust is key to that. And people need to hear things that they uh, can believe because they trust the source. Now, one of the things that we at the FIA Foundation have been working hard on, and we, we were doing this as part of the work in Poland too, is to uh, analyze on-road emissions from vehicles and to see what really happens. Uh, secondhand vehicles, absolutely too, because very often their uh, ability to be clean is diminished, but even the newest vehicles are often not emitting on the road what they um, are uh, supposed to be emitting according to tested values. And this is the real urban emissions initiative, the true initiative that we support and I know others in, in this call are, are working with that too. And I wonder, Anthony, do you think that sort of evidence is, is going to be good enough to unlock all of those um, car drivers and their, and their preference? Indeed, in some might say their addiction to uh, four wheels. What do you think? Are you optimistic that independent data like that could help? Uh, thanks, Sheila. I think definitely that data could help, but there is much more to do uh, to actually learn people how to use their vehicles in a different manner or to give up on some of their precious cars from time to time. And when I'm thinking about the current moment and the next six months, I would say that the COVID crisis is definitely the defining moment for our activities, not only in Poland, but also in Europe and worldwide. That's, that's kind of an obvious, but actually uh, what, what is our role here is to inspire both leaders and the society or societies to change and to challenge their way of thinking. And we can do that with data, we can do that with early uh, best cases or early cases of change, we can do that with, 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 with solid communication, but definitely that's the moment when we can convince that the other world is possible and that this other world is actually should be better and will be better. Absolutely. That's a very inspirational way to end your comment. It could be better and it must be better. But at the end of the day, sometimes we still have to fight our way through those very traditional levers of which, Agnieszka, you you know, you described in, in, in some detail in, in your contribution. Um, and I wonder how you feel our our, our earlier round of, of questions was really around our level of optimism and, and the challenge of the next six months. Um, do you think that within your sphere that you're able to see a very positive way forward? Do you still see major challenges within the context of Poland? 
Uh, it's it's very interesting to listen uh, a, a different perspective from different stakeholders. Uh, I would say that uh, well, if this will not work, then the lawyers will get involved and we will push and try to enforce uh, the law, the right to clean and healthy air. So um, I think uh, within the next six months, we will see how serious the decision makers are taking the, their um, um, obligation to uh, implement uh, effective measures. Uh, until end of September in Poland, most of the uh, regional uh, municipalities should implement new air quality plans which are basic documents to improve air quality in the most polluted areas. Uh, we as Client Earth will assess uh, the, the most uh, significant and, and the most dramatic uh, regions. And uh, we will let you know how seriously the decision makers are taking the, the um, air, air pollution and how, how effective measures they are proposing uh, to improve it as quickly as possible. Thank you, Agnieszka. Yes, please do let us know. That's part, I think, of everything we do. Although we're doing it on Zoom calls, we're building networks and we're reinforcing networks this way. And I think we would all like to know. Uh, and thank you so much to each of you for your contributions to this panel uh, and for sticking so beautifully to time, which means that we're able to move on to the next section. So thank you so much indeed uh, for your contributions. And now we turn to the third session of this panel, uh, which is in a sense the question of the day, which is what can we all learn from these uniquely Polish experiences? Uh, some of which seem very familiar, some of those I recognize very well, and some are very distinct, I think. Uh, and how can that help our work as stakeholders, practitioners, policy people, funders, and that's particularly close to my heart. Um, how can we, for example, encourage our grant towards greater collaboration, something which our last panel was very clear was terribly important and shared problem solving. Uh, and then for, I think, our policy people, you know, what do we do and how do we build country action plans and roadmaps, which, as was said earlier, put the meat behind the target and the political commitment. And how do we do that in a way which builds in, with the fullest engagement of all of the leaders in the sector, uh, be they individuals who take it upon themselves to force change, or in a sense, those of us who get have our day jobs in this field. So um, I'd like now to turn to our, our final uh, three speakers. And, and first of those um, is, is Dietmar um, from the European Climate Foundation. Dietmar, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself more fully. Um, and I know the European Climate Foundation have a great focus on transport work. And as part of that, the promotion of EVs, which has come up in the discussions that we've had so far. And I just wonder what you see as the relevance of the evidence that we've heard today uh, from Poland for the rest of your grant making work in Europe. Thank you, Sheila. <clears throat> uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Dietmar Uliga. I'm leading ECF's transport program and I'm based in Berlin. And I mean, for, for me, the most important message is um, that we cannot and, and this message is not really new, but yeah, I heard it today uh, a few times that we cannot treat all the EU countries equally, right? Uh, Poland differs in many ways from, for example, Germany, the UK, Spain, or Norway, which is often set uh, or understood as a role model for the deployment of electric vehicles, yeah? But also, I mean, the the transport sector and especially uh, the, the car market is, is different in Poland than it uh, is uh, in, in many other countries in Europe. Um, I think Poland can learn a lot from other countries, as Germany did in, 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 in the last months, uh, looking at Norway and other leading uh, markets uh, for EVs in the Netherlands, for example. Um, but I think the, the obstacles uh, for the deployment of EVs, um, they are similar in most of the countries, right? Uh, there are subsidies still in place for uh, diesel cars and also uh, fuels. The charging network uh, is not really properly developed in most of, or in some of the regions. And also the, the electric electricity grid needs to be improved. And yes, 
let's be honest, there is quite often a price gap between uh, electric vehicles and uh, a used or a new diesel car. Yeah? And, and that, that price gap needs to be closed. But I mean, it, it's, it's also clear from me that you cannot transfer for all the measures one-to-one -one from, let's say, Germany to Poland. Yeah? For example, even with, with some financial incentives for zero emission vehicles, many people still simply could not afford to buy a new uh, electric uh, car, yeah? uh, either for a commercially or a privately used car. And, uh, and, and many people cannot charge at home or uh, at public charging stations. Yeah? And, and a second a second hand EV, EV uh, electric vehicles market, we talked about that, uh, which is so important for many Eastern European countries and also for Poland, that hardly exists so far. Yeah? Um, but let me also maybe briefly uh, mention another key aspect, uh, which is very important for us as ECF, and that is uh, the role of Poland as an automotive uh, producer. Yeah? I mean, uh, Looking at Poland after Germany and France, Poland is the most uh, in Poland the most people uh, there are the most people in the in the, in the car production yeah? more than two hundred or around two hundred and fifteen thousand. That is even more than in Spain. Yeah, so if the transition from diesel and gasoline cars to EVs is to succeed, we need the broad social acceptance and also the acceptance of uh, the Polish government. Then, so. Um, we are mainly working on two narratives. The, the first one is, uh, yeah, make clear that the internal combustion engine is harmful for the climate and also for your health. We heard about that uh, many times today. So even the latest version of the diesel and gasoline cars are still not uh, clean, yeah? Uh, that's uh, why we, we support NGOs to work um, on the issue. But the se second narrative is also that there is no alternative to the electric car, also not in Poland. But if this is really true, Poland must, let's say, uh, help to shape the transition rather than blocking it. If Poland blocks it, uh, then I'm afraid manufacturers and also suppliers, uh, almost, by the way, all of them uh, who are uh, have their headquarters in Western Europe, uh, and, but also the new players coming from the US or China, they will dominate the market and accordingly concentrate jobs outside of Poland. And I think that is something that uh, Poland must must avoid. Uh, yeah, maybe let me let me stop stop here and and uh, back to you, Sheila. Thank you very much, Dima. I think that's a great point that you make about the potential loss of of employment and movement yet again elsewhere. Um, I think that's something that many countries in Europe have experienced. And it's one of those things about the European Union that you would hope the countries watch and learn and see what happens to other people and, and take uh, advice, as it were, from there. I'm curious, you made the point, I think, again, a good point, that you have to engage in policy if you want to shape policy. And I think that's right. And that EVs may well not be quite right yet for the Polish market in terms of affordability. We know there's a massive flood of secondhand vehicles. And by this, I mean secondhand internal combustion. We know they're coming because in some ways we're cleaning up our cities. What are your thoughts on the react what, what the reaction of uh, what re the reaction of Poland should be to that, which in a sense almost predates the electric vehicle point. Well, I think when it comes to the second uh, of the current existing uh, second-hand market, uh, yeah, a lot of these are rather well, well they're, not, they're not really old, but they are still really polluting. Yeah, Euro five, Euro six diesel cars. Uh, if they are sold to Poland, I think it, it is very important that. Uh, that the that the te technology, which is far from being perfect, is uh, being controlled properly. Yeah. Um, so controlling the after treatment technology that it is in place. Yeah. Particulate filters, uh, NOx catalysts. Uh, very often we hear that they are simply removed. Yeah. Once they are in Poland, uh, the same for trucks. Uh, I mean, we have rather quite clean uh, new. Um, diesel trucks, yeah, Euro 6 diesel trucks, uh, relatively clean when it comes to air uh, uh, quality, but uh, we made testings uh, and 20% of the even the new uh, trucks uh, in real world are Euro 0 because simply uh, some of these truck operators um, switch off the AdBlue uh, technology, right? So controlling uh, 
the technology. I think that's a problem all over Europe, yeah, uh, but especially in Eastern European countries. Absolutely, it's as much a problem of regulation of enforcement as it is of enforcement regulation and controlling. Yeah. And, and absolutely, and then of course there's the next stage where they leave Eastern Europe and travel to Africa and get a third life in many cases. So thank you, Dietmar. Thank you very much indeed for your thoughts. Um, and I'm going to turn now to Climate Works uh, and, and and Anthony, who we we have here. Hi, Anthony. Um, and I know Climate Works engages in these sorts of issues too, but outside of Europe. So you have a wider remit, you're, you're looking and, and supporting around the world. And I know you've played a big role, for example, in the advanced clean truck policy in California, which is relatively recently developed. Uh, so building perhaps on what Dietmar, Dietmar was sharing, um, what do you think we can learn more globally uh, from the Polish examples we've been hearing and the, the approach that's being taken by the IKEA Foundation funded partners there? Excellent. Uh, thank you, Sheila. Um, first, I want to uh, just uh, thank for to IKEA Foundation for hosting this. Uh, I appreciated the uh, CEO's comment about the need for unprecedented collaboration. Uh, at ClimateWorks, we believe that we can tackle the climate crisis if governments, private sector, civil society uh, work together. And our mission is, is, is simple, even though the challenge is complex, which is to end the climate crisis by amplifying the power of philanthropy. Um, so to your question, Sheila, um, yeah, I'd like to maybe just cover this this example, of fairly recent uh, policy adoption. And I'm also glad we're talking about trucks. Uh, I think oftentimes when people think of electric vehicles, uh, they immediately sort of focus in on the passenger side, which is definitely important. And we need uh, electric cars to, to address the challenge. Uh, but in a lot of countries, most of the pollution comes from trucks, uh, medium heavy duty commercial trucks, including particulate matter and NOx uh, that causes some of the worst uh, health problems. And if we're going to meet our climate goals, we need basically everything on the road that moves, including two and three wheelers, vans, buses, and trucks to shift from oil combustion to cleaner electric drive uh, powered increasingly by renewable energy or, or hydrogen. And uh, to get there, we're going to need smart government policies, especially those that drive the vehicle supply of vehicle demand and the necessary infrastructure deployment. Uh, so uh, earlier this year, uh, California adopted the advanced clean truck rule, which is really the first kind, first of its kind in the world. Um, and it really now has become a model policy that we are looking and hope, hope to see adopted in other parts of the world, including other US states, Europe. Uh, it would be great to see Poland adopt this as well as uh, Asia. So the story of this is really a story of a collaborative effort uh, supported through philanthropy. In 2019, the agency that oversees uh, both air quality and climate policy here in California, the Air Resources B Board uh, began a consideration of a new rule uh, that would set targets and requirements for truck manufacturers to produce an increasing percentage of zero emission medium and heavy duty trucks over time. Um, the original rule was, was rather modest uh, and uh, philanthropy was able to support a diverse and increasingly powerful coalition of around uh, 70 individuals and about over 20 groups uh, that re represented constituencies from the environmental justice community, the health community, uh, labor organizations, business organizations, and uh, particularly community groups that were most affected by the pollution to sort of come together to advocate for an increase in both the scope and the stringency of the initial proposal. Um, the messaging uh, that the coalition used to great effect was around the need for um, improvements to air quality, uh, the direct effects on public health, uh, that this was going to be a necessary uh, strengthening to achieve the state's climate goals, and that the a stronger rule was both technically feasible and economically beneficial, um, including for, for jobs. Uh, a number of organizations represented communities that live in the most polluted areas uh, within the state, uh, including this uh, area called the diesel, diesel death zone um, in and around ports, highways, distribution centers, and genuinely spoke to the direct impact on both their health and their livelihoods. Uh, this is also a story around uh, international uh, knowledge sharing and collaboration because they were able to draw upon experience and uh, knowledge from other parts of the world, like in China, where you have cities like Shenzhen, uh, which already has over 60,000 
uh, zero emission electric delivery trucks uh, delivering goods daily. Um, organizations like uh, CalStart and their new uh, Global Drive to Zero uh, program, uh, which was able to sort of showcase an increase in global vehicle supply and uh, increasing demand from fleets. Um, and that included um, the EV100 program that uh, Maria mentioned uh, that's supported by us and uh, We Mean Business uh, that now covers more than 4 million vehicles, including uh, demand for uh, fleet demands for medium and heavy duty trucks. So uh, what was the outcome of all this? The coalition was able to successfully uh, convince the board to uh, support a much, much stronger rule, rule that will dramatically increase the number of electric, electric trucks on the road uh, as much as 50% of new sales by 2035. Uh, this nearly doubles the benefits for both air pollution and climate, and it ensures that the buyers, the people who need these trucks, um, will have ample supply uh, of the types that they need. Um, Immediately after that, about 15 states, U.S. states, uh, representing uh, about half the U.S. economy, signed a memorandum of understanding uh, to work together uh, to achieve 100% uh, sales uh, by or before 2045. Uh, and a, quite a number of bilateral consultations have already begun between California, uh, European partners, China, India. Uh, and certainly we see this as something that could be readily adopted by other jurisdictions. Uh, including Poland, uh, to uh, drive the cleanest uh, supply of trucks. Um, and then it's, the final point I'd make is that uh, philanthropy does support a number of these collaborations, um, the Drive to Zero, the International Zero Emission Vehicle Alliance, uh, the Green and Healthy Streets Program, which Warsaw is a, is a partner to, um, and any number of these collaborative uh, platforms for sort of peer learning uh, and uh, ambition and joint action uh, are uh, very much uh, available to um, the partners in Poland. Thank you so much, Anthony. And um, uh, uh, as a philanthropy ourselves at, at FIA Foundation, we support work through an initiative called the Global Fuel Economy Initiative, ICCT, a partner in that, UC Davis, people I know that you work with very closely. Uh, and I think um, that knowledge sharing between experts in the field is absolutely crucial. Um, I feel I couldn't really let you go as it were without at least posing this question to you you may choose not to answer it but one of the issues that's come up in our panel today is political will uh, and you speak very eloquently of the partnership and the groundwork and the building towards the change that you've seen in California uh, and the role that philanthropy has played there on the grander scale uh, when one looks at central governments and um, potential movements away from some of the, the spirit of change that we might have seen in place not too many years ago when you have governments which don't come from those perspectives. Do you think philanthropy can operate on, on, on that larger scale or do you think it's always best to be supporting grassroots and, um, and initiatives almost at that level instead? Sure. Uh, so briefly, I, I think we need it all. Um, I think ultimately for this, you know, we're talking about the transition of a of a over five trillion dollar global industry um, for vehicles and fuels, and to imagine uh, moving that from its current system to one that's significantly cleaner is going to require the support of grassroots, grass tops, government entities. Um, but I think um, my final point is that I'm very optimistic, increasingly optimistic, because in the end, the system is better. Um, it's, and not just better for the climate, but better across the board, better for health, better for jobs, better for local economies. And so I think um, once that becomes increasingly evident to especially the, the decision makers, um, I think we will achieve a tipping point in the relatively near future that will usher in a whole new system that is consistent with a safe climate. Thank you so much, Anthony. That's an extremely positive note on which to, to move on to our, our final contribution. Thank you, Anthony, for, for that. So, um, Ed, uh, Edgar van der Brugge, who is Programme Manager at IKEA Foundation, this is your event. Uh, you've managed to sit here now and hear all these contributions. Um, and I wonder, therefore, if I can ask you what you at IKEA Foundation take away from this programme of work and what you think other philanthropies can learn from it. And I have my my pen at the ready, I'll be noting things down from our point of view. Thank you for that introduction, uh, Sheila. Uh, yes, hello everybody. My name is uh, Edgar van der Brug. I'm Program Manager Climate Action at IKEA Foundation. Um, Honored to be uh, last in line today, uh, humbled by the many good speakers before me, uh, many of which uh, represent partners that we, uh, that we work with. A um, couple of important items have actually already been mentioned by, by several speakers. 
to start with Per, who mentioned indeed, uh, I believe, an unprecedented collaboration between partners, between funders as well. Um, and has also, and has actually already been mentioned by, by some as well, to get to systems change. And, and we, we strongly feel that at the IKEA Foundation as well. Uh, to get to the phasing out of in, internal combustion engines, um, we have to support different, uh, different coalitions of partners. We have to um, influence different uh, ecosystems at the same time. It has already been mentioned, we, we cannot forget about policymakers, the corporate sector and the general public. Um, we have to, our whole strategy at IKEA Foundation is actually built around those uh, ecosystems. And you could say our strategy as a funder is kind of a matrix strategy. Um, as has also mentioned, uh, has been mentioned by Dietmar, for example, you cannot treat transport in the same way in every country. And that's why we indeed have a matrix uh, strategy in which we work in different sectors like transport in different core geographies where sometimes approaches are different. Um, now to give examples for working with policymakers, uh, we do work, for example, with uh, the European Climate Foundation, uh, Climate Works Foundation, um, the International Council on uh, Clean uh, Transportation. Um, to influence the general public, um, we work, for example, with Healthcare Without Harm, the Clean Air Fund, using doctors and nurses as uh, trusted ambassadors. To get the policymakers and the corporates working together, we stimulate, uh, indeed, initiatives like Anthony mentioned, the International Zero Emissions Vehicle Alliance, C40, um, C40 Green and Healthy Streets, the Global Drive to Zero. Um, as a funder, I would say we are in a unique position um, that, that we can see what, what different partners are doing in these core geographies and how their activities um, can, can actually connect and how they can fill gaps, um, for example, in Poland. Um, so if we look at Poland, we see activities from, from EV100 supported by Women Business, but we see also, of course, the activities from the European Climate Foundation and Clean Air Fund uh, and Client Earth. What we ask and how we work together with partners is that we um, ask them to, to strategize around the, the members, for example, that they have, have managed to bind to their initiatives, see where gaps are in terms of policymakers, in terms of civil society, in terms of the corporate members, and then to overcome hurdles by basically making a, work a roadmap together that has been mentioned today before, the importance of national roadmaps um, and then strategize around uh, key events. Um, and as, as Maria said, bringing the right speakers in front of the right audience at those key moments in time. I'll keep it uh, to that, uh, Sheila. Thank you very much indeed, Edgar. And I think when you look at the matrix, the, the system that is in place operating in Poland right now, then you can see the impact of that. And I think it's something of which IKEA Foundation should be very proud and the rest of us will look on and learn. And I'm afraid we're pretty much at the end of our time now. Um, amazingly, actually, it's sped by for me. Um, so um, if you will allow, I, I, I will just take two minutes now to sum up what I think we've seen and heard today and where it um, uh, leaves us. Um, I think I heard from pretty much everyone that we all have to be bold and brave and passionate and ambitious and have drive. And that's always the case, but never more so than now. Um, I've also heard, I think that evidence is absolutely essential to shape public opinion, to shape uh, political uh, activity, to shape regulation and legal change. Uh, and also um, that that changing public opinion is utterly essential to give the politicians the space they need to make the change that we all want to see. Um, and, and in that, philanthropy can play a really important role, whether you're relatively small or medium sized or, or really quite huge. We each, I think, can um, take some care to uh, think hard about where we place our funds to ensure that we're always mindful of that collaborative um, instinct. And I think, um, as I said earlier, there are some great examples here in Poland and great examples, including initiatives such as the Clean Air Fund, which both IKEA Foundation and ourselves are part of. So having heard everything we've heard from Poland, where I think it is fair to say um, that the rubber is hitting the road, um, I hope that those of you who've been listening in through 
uh, Facebook and uh, LinkedIn uh, and YouTube have taken away some uh, interesting insights and are going to be able to apply them elsewhere. Um, and I thank everybody who contributed today uh, very much indeed for your contribution. You're all popping back up here. This is a beautiful thing, isn't it? This whole online conferencing thing. So everyone is able to say uh, goodbye to the audience and uh, uh, and I'm sure and I hope we all get the chance to continue our collaborations in a more face-to-face -face manner in the near future. Everyone stay well and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Tina. Thank you all.